Clarita here, and I've got a new sponsor, DistroKid. If you want to release your music into the world, DistroKid's the easiest way to get your music into all the major streaming platforms, unlimited uploads, and keep 100% of your royalties. And because you're a Design Freaks listener, you get 30% off. Go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Design Freaks. DistroKid. This episode is sponsored by Isotope. Their audio software like RX helps to clean up my recordings, and they have a ton of other products on their site, isotope.com slash ruinous. Right now, Ruinous Media and Fretboard Journal listeners save 10% at checkout on any Isotope plugin or bundle using the code FRET10. So if you have a podcast or produce music, go to isotope.com slash ruinous and shop their award-winning audio production products and save 10% off your order with the code FRET10. Make your audio sound better. Welcome. You're listening to the Design Freaks podcast on the Ruinous Media Network, and I'm your host, Clarita, and this is episode 32, all about Milton Glaser's record covers and especially his display typefaces. A small tribute. Uh, if you're a new listener, this is a show about record covers, graphic design, music history, design history, and the freaks behind it all. Uh, speaking of freaks, Thank you to Ruinous Media. <laughs> it sounded bad. Thank you for your support, listeners. Um, freaky listeners, uh, y'all are the coolest. I wanted to thank you for subscribing. And if you haven't, please do. And if you like the show, please leave a review. Tell all your designer and vinyl collector friends. Send suggestions and jokes. You can find photos and other info about this and every episode I've done at designfreakspodcast.com. And you can follow my socials from there and also check out this and other incredible podcasts at ruinousmedia.com. So let's talk about Milton Glaser. Uh, last June, during COVID, unfortunately, we lost a design giant. Um, Milton Glaser was born on June 26, 1929. And while I was doing research, I was like, oh, he died in June and he was born in June. Wait a minute. It was like the total delayed reaction. He died on his birthday, his 91st birthday. So lived a long life, worked almost all the way up until he died. Um, but yeah, June 26, 1929 to June 26, 2020. First of all, his wife and only immediate survivor was Shirley Glazer. Shout out to Shirley. Um, said the cause of his death was a stroke. He also had renal failure. So, wow, even more amazing. He lived so long. So, it just to clear up, it was not a heart attack from a surprise birthday party. And I'm only saying that because, it, you know, it does come to mind when someone passes on their 91st birthday. Uh, was it a surprise party? Maybe don't give a surprise party to Milton Glazer <laughs> during COVID on his birthday. But yeah, it was um, uh, a stroke, unfortunately. But what a coincidence. Uh, Milton Glazer once said, describing the artwork of himself and Pushpin Studios, he said, Art Nouveau, Chinese wash drawing, German woodcuts, American primitive paintings, the Viennese secession, and cartoons of the 1930s were an endless source of inspiration. He also added all the things that the doctrine of orthodox modernism seemed to have contempt for. So ornamentation, narrative illustration, visual ambiguity. And he said, that's what attracted us. So I think that pretty much sums up the work of Pushpin Studios beautifully. And I also want to say that um, MG was really known for his quotes. There's a lot of them out there. Um, you can find a bunch of really... Uh, a really memorable ones online. He was very opinionated. Here's one. Um, here's a quote. I'm going to run down 10 
uh, Milton Glaser facts, and it's starting with this quote. This is probably the most famous one by him. There are three responses to a piece of design. Yes, no, and wow. Wow is the one to aim for. And you're welcome for not doing my Owen Wilson impression. Um, uh, yeah, but anyway, that quote is kind of what makes him the patron saint of design freaks. Wow. Um, number two, the Bob Dylan design based on a black and white self-portrait silhouette by Marcel Duchamp, the artist. And he added thick wavy bands of color for the hair forms he imported from Islamic art. So he liked the sign from Mexico I'm going to talk about in a minute. He was influenced by uh, art from all over the world. Um, let's see. Number three, our heart, I heart and why his logo for a 1977 campaign to promote tourism in New York state achieved even, even wider currency than his other work, um, sketched on the back of an envelope with red crayon during a taxi ride. I mean, what's more New York than that? Um, that design was uh, embraced again after nine 11. Uh, number four, Milton Glaser was born on June 26, 1929 in the Bronx to Eugene and Eleanor Bergman Glaser. Ugh. And they were immigrants from Hungary. It's such a New York story. His father owned a dry cleaning and tailoring shop and his mother was a homemaker. Number five, after twice failing the entrance exam for Pratt Institute, that should encourage some folks out there. Um, he worked at a package design company before being accepted by the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Number six, after graduating from Cooper Union in 1951 and working in the promotion department at Vogue magazine, Mr. Glazer won a Fulbright scholarship to the Academy of Fine Arts in Bologna, Italy. Why don't we pronounce it Bologna when it's spelled the same? Um, when it's in Italy... Uh, where he studied etching with the still life painter Giorgio Morandi. And uh, in the time honored way, he drew from plaster casts. The experience left him a fervent believer in the discipline of drawing and an enemy of found images and collage in design work. Uh, very opinionated. He had lots of hot takes on the correct way to do things. But as we all know, there's room for lots of design approaches. But uh, that was his take. Number seven, he married Shirley Girton, um, his replacement at the package design company that first hired him in 1957. Uh, the couple collaborated on the children's books, If Apples Had Teeth from 1960, cute, um, and The Alpha Zeds from 2003, and The Big Race from 2005, adorable. They lived in Manhattan and Woodstock, New York. Number eight. Mr. Glazer, whom Newsweek once called one of the few geniuses in the image-making trade, was widely credited with creating the pudgy, cartoony style known as yellow submarine art, popularized by, popularized by the 1968 animated Beatles film, but practiced at Pushpin since the late 1950s. Take that, Beatles. <laughs> Number nine. Uh, Mr. Glazer designed several projects for the restaurateur Joe Baum, B-A-U-M. Um, most memorably, the big kitchen food court on the ground floor concourse of the World Trade Center. Um, and these are the seven and a half foot tall architectural letter forms that spelled the words big kitchen. And he designed these for the food court that later became, uh, and the letters later became the big kitchen font. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later when we get into that. And then drum roll number 10. He also designed for the final season of the television series Mad Men in 2014, along with tons of other credits. I don't have time to go into all of it, but perhaps I will revisit for an episode two of Milton Glaser. And I mentioned the Mad Men just to illustrate, again, how remarkable he worked up until the very end of his life. No retiring for this artist. He was just driven. And that is so inspiring to me. There's definitely covers that that uh, look very Milton Glaser esque, but uh, I did learn some new things because there's other covers that kind of deviate from his normal style too. So that's kind of interesting. 
His designs include, like I said, the I Heart New York, uh, the psychedelic Bob Dylan poster, logos for DC Comics, Stony Brook University, and Brooklyn Brewery. Um, in 1954, he co-founded Pushpin Studios, and he co-founded New York Magazine with Clay Felker. Um, he also established Milton Glaser Incorporated in 1974. His artwork has been featured in tons of exhibits, permanent collections, museums worldwide. Throughout his long career, he designed many posters, publications, and architectural designs. Uh, lots of stuff. I mean, ads, calendars. It's just, it's crazy how much stuff he did. Um, and then he was actually the first graphic designer to ever receive the National Medal of the Arts Award. And he got that from President Barack Obama in 2009. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> um, the cool thing about his record covers um, is that even with a simple design, there's always more to it. For instance, he some of the typefaces on those covers were sort of letter forms that he custom made for that particular album. And then he ended up afterward expanding those into an entire proper font. So he'd create the entire alphabet and then use those, use that typeface or that font family that he just created for other albums. So pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and also other designers would use it on their album covers. Uh, with digital typography, people have taken his typefaces and sort of expanded on them and sort of adapted them for digital use. I have a quote, and this is, I, um, everything that I uh, am referencing right now, everything I'm going to be talking about, I got from articles or the SVA uh, archive site or this blog by designer Reagan Ray. And I'm going to have all the links to all of these sources in my show notes. So if you look on the Apple show notes, if you click on the word details, you should be able to see it. It's under the the category sources, and it's kind of just a, a link dump, but it should all be there. Um, let's see. So Reagan Ray in his blog says, uh, and he actually curated 200 of Milton Glaser's album covers for SVA and uh, has a really uh, cool, really comprehensive blog. Let's see. He says, Glazer had a long history with record labels. Uh, according to Discogs, he was credited with the design of 255 albums, actually it's 257 now, over the course of 60 years. His relationship with record label executive Kevin Eggers led him to explore a variety of covers for the Poppy and Tomato record labels, including the career of Towns Van Zant. So yeah, chances are, if it's on that tomato label during that um, the 70s, it's probably a Glazer design. Um Glazer considers his career as a graphic designer a, quote, preordained condition. Very interesting. In 1954, at just 25 years old, along with Seymour Quast, uh, Reynold Ruffins, and Edward Sorrell, founded Pushpin Studios, a graphic design firm that Glazer said was run, quote, like a bunch of art students trying to change history. The reason why he's a freak is because Pushpin started... It says here they inspired a seismic shift away from the exacting and severe Swiss precisionism. So pretty much since the 1930s, uh, design was was very, like, painfully precise. It was, uh, you know, like the Bauhaus type of stuff, um, very much on the grid and adheres to all the rules. Yeah, I, I like the severe Swiss precisionism. That's a really interesting term. So they wanted to get more loose, get weird get surreal and incorporate art. And so that's exactly what they did. They kind of melded the two worlds of art and design and did it beautifully and masterfully, um, in my opinion. Um, so the studio was regarded as a beacon for the new modern era of graphic design. Uh, so much so that in 1970, they were the first American studio to have an exhibition at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. Uh, and several early works by Glazer from this era are featured in the auction, including works for the studio's equally influential monthly magazine, Pushpin Graphic. Well, I'd love to get my dirty hands on a couple of issues of that. And then this was an interesting quote by Milton Glazer. I thought it was a little bit contradictory, but I, I'm having trouble kind of deciphering exactly what he meant. He says, 
This is one of his rules. Quote, style is not to be trusted. Style change is usually linked to economic factors, as all of you know who have read Marx. Also, fatigue occurs when people see too much of the same thing too often. So it's interesting, first of all, that he should talk about that visual fatigue because his work was everywhere. And but I thought that was the power in it, um, that it was so Im- embedded in people's subconsciousness that it's a different style of getting your work out there, um, sort of having it be like the I Heart in New York. It's just so it doesn't even belong to you anymore. Like like I was talking about in the Jaws, the soundtracks episode at a certain point and in the Metallica episode at a certain point, your artwork isn't yours. Um, it belongs to the world. It seems like with, with some things that are become so popular, there's no licensing or control that you can uh, really implement. So, but yeah, the beginning of it, style is not to be trusted because it's like linked to capitalism or whatever. Um, and then he references Marx. I wonder if that's because he's attributing style to like the fashion world, which is linked to commerce and sales. So yeah, maybe that's kind of like a conundrum that he was wrestling with is you can't trust style because it's based in capitalism, which naturally it's it's not a social natural human thing, but also people get tired of something when it's seen too often. That's really interesting. But his work is everywhere and very recognizable. You can, yeah, you can see a bunch of his albums at the um, SVA uh, School of Visual Arts website, but there's also a a large online collection of his other graphic design work, like posters, the calendar I mentioned. I might, even though this is mainly about his record covers, there's a really cool United Artists recording company poster that he did, like a promo poster, and it's called Planet of the Tapes. And the original art, the black and white, like, study, and then the final color version, they're both so cool. Um, I just absolutely love everything he did. The Simon and Garfunkel poster where he actually created a, uh, that shadow typeface and then created the figures for si- uh, Simon and Garfunkel modeled after the typeface instead of the other way around. It's just really cool. So, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about Pushpin really quick. So uh, he founded it with designers Seymour Quast, Ed Sorrell, Reynold Ruffins. So just the work generated by the studio uh, from 1974 to 2020, the collection of his work from Pushpin includes approximately 700 pieces of original art, 1,700 sketches, 380 posters, 150 prints, as well as 29 boxes of newspapers and magazines, album covers, menus, letterhead, annual reports. Who had their annual report designed by Milton Glaser? That's so amazing. Brochures, books, like book covers, um, designed or il- and or illustrated by Glazer. Wow. And just incredible. That is an incredible body of work. So I'm referencing fontsanduse.com, but I'm also looking at the archives.sva.edu blog post about, it's called A Brief Tour of Milton Glaser's Typography. He kind of came at type design as a non-type designer, which makes these display fonts so interesting to me, but also kind of impossibly complicated. (laughs) Yeah, and he admits he's not a type designer. Um his typefaces only came into being as the product of graphic ideas applied to letter forms, which I think is really cool. It's kind of like got a childlike quality. He has a really stylized uh, approach to type and let's see, three dimensionality. He's kind of influenced a lot of people with that, the 3D thing and the really solid black shadows. Um, His typefaces combine pushpin arrow deco motifs with conventions adapted from hand painted signs but share a tendency to imbue generic letter forms with geometric dimension. So here's six examples. So the first font I want to talk about is Baby Teeth. And um, this is, 
He created this in 1964. Baby Teeth is one of Glazer's earliest and most successful typefaces used in his most famous poster, which I'm assuming they're talking about uh, the Dylan poster alongside many other notable music promotions, tons of stuff. And other people copied these letter forms, um, did variations on them. Oh, here's a quote. And I'm going to post the photo of this again. Thank you to SVA because it's really helpful to see this, to know what he's talking about. So he says the inspiration for my baby teeth typeface came from this sign I photographed in Mexico City. It's an advertisement for a tailor. The E was drawn as only someone unfamiliar with the alphabet could have conceived. Uh, Yet it is completely legible. I tried to invent the rest of the alphabet consistent with this model. So I think what he meant was someone unfamiliar with traditional type design. It's interesting. Uh, I'm going to use this photo from, I'm not sure if this is the actual photo he took in Mexico or if he recreated the sign, but it says trajes finos abrigos, which is um, fine suits and coats. And so from those letters alone, he had to create an entire alphabet, but that's enough to work with, I think, um, as long as you have some idea and these are display types, typefaces, so you don't really need a lowercase alphabet. And there's definitely, I think, enough letter forms here to create the rest of the missing letters, but uh, pretty cute. I like the original. He did change the I and the T, the capital T, and uh, the original sign put an underline under the O, which looks kind of confusing. And the I is a triangle with a, like a circle balancing on top, um, which he changed. Yeah, so he turned that into baby teeth. I should also add that baby teeth came in eight variations. There was a line version uh, that had these straight hairline notches in the letters to create a more clear letter form. Um, and then opaque which had no counters. It was like the solid one Um, dotted that had dotted counters, which that one I've seen the least often Um, Baroque that had curve notches each in solid and outlined versions. Let's see what's something we know besides the Bob Dylan thing. Uh, Definitely the Herbie Hancock, the, the Herbie Hancock sextant with the moon, the moon painting on it. That's incredible. There, oh, the Mahalia Jackson. There's an extruded version um, on the Milton by Milton uh, Nascimento. The Seekers, I mean, on and on. Just a million. There's a Led Zeppelin cover, a disco fire. Someone just added fire to that. So yeah, this this kind of works with like earthy 70s vibe or cosmic vibe. I mean, it's kind of like pretty versatile. It's just very geometric and blocky. Whatever color you apply, it really makes a statement. Uh, The next one is called Baby Fat. And this one's pretty typical for like old soul records, some jazz. I've seen um, some dub albums with this. It's basically an extruded 3D letter form with an opposite shadow that doesn't make sense on the other side. Um, I'm going to post all of these so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, and this one, he created uh, 1967 for a Simon and Garfunkel poster, which I talked about. He notes that Baby Fat inspired his approach to his fam- famous Simon and Garfunkel poster of 1967. And the type following the example of the graphic, the reverse happened. The shape of the letters dictated the treatment of the figures, which I love. He, tr- he basically created a Paul Simon letter and an Art Garfunkel letter. <laughs> So there's an adaption of this called Buxom, and it's from the facsimile fonts foundry, (laughs) alliteration much, from 1970. It's a caps-only adaption of the black style, uh, which in turn has been adopted by uh, Letraset as Fat Shadow, and the digital version called Keep on Truckin', NF, which stands for Nix fonts, from 2007. Um, So Buxom has been used on quite a few records as well. It's very similar to Baby Fat. Um, It's been used on the Ramones single for Blitzkrieg Pop, Havana Affair, Um, a Soft Machine record as well, um, the William Burroughs from 1970, and Dillinger, Ready Natty Dready from 1975. Um, So the next one is called uh, Houdini, and it's very cute. It's got a bunch of little lines in it, though. It's, 
uh, it's very graphic and cool looking, but it's not really practical. Like if I were de- designing a typeface, if I were thinking about how is a designer going to apply color, um, I don't know. It's it's real. I really love it, and it, it's very rounded uh, and very seventies looking. I just absolutely love it, and it has the shading on one side of the letter to look three D. And then the next one is called Hologram Shadow. And this one is really cool. And I've seen it recently. Um, the Jacuzzi Boys use it. So Gabe Gabriel Alcala, who's um, the guitar player for Jacuzzi Boys, he uh, is an incredible artist and designer, very inspired by Milton Glaser, and has used a few of the letter forms um, and typefaces on their record covers. So kind of carrying the torch, keeping it alive in such a cool way and in a modern way, though. So he created Hologram Shadow in 1977. And he, uh, Glazer said he had uh, it had been in his head for a while before he had a chance to actually make use of it. And he found his opportunity in a poster for a festival for United Artists. And uh, he also got a chance, and they don't have an example of that, but the example that I will share that they shared here is uh, a poster for this, the museum of, I, I guess you pronounce it holography, and it's called uh, Holodian, or Around Holodian is the name of the exhibit. The letter form is, it's basically a hollow cylinder, and the counters of the letters are punched out you know, um, and then the backs of the cylinders are incomplete. So it looks like a piece of paper curling around, but not quite like where the edges don't quite meet so that the counters can be hollow, if that makes sense. Because if you completed the, the, the cylinder, then there wouldn't be the color showing through the counter. You just have to see it. Um, and then, so the original one for the Holodian poster thing was, I think one of just a couple of examples where he had the inside of the cylinder not solid black. So the version that Gabriel Alcala used for the Jacuzzi Boys singles and stuff 2007 to 2011 record, that is uh, a variation called Baby Curls. Artwork is by Gabriel, a very talented designer, I have to agree, frequently inspired by the pushpin aesthetic. Uh, For the band name, he used Hologram Shadow, which is the original one I was just talking about. Chances are the actual font use is Nick Curtis's Capital Ideas What? Uh, A digital interpretation of Hologram Shadow in its lowercase slots. Interesting. Oh, also notable, um, Gabriel used for the title... Uh, Jacuzzi Boys he used, Baby Curls, and then for the other text he used, one of my other favorites, Windsor. Another adapted typeface that the Jacuzzi Boys use masterfully is called Coochie Nando. (laughs) And this is based on Big Kitchen. Um, So... Uh, Nick Curtis designed this, and Nick Curtis and Milton Glaser are both credited. Yeah, it just says it's a digital revival based on Milton Glaser's Glaser Kitchen. So the story behind Kitchen is, um, and this is a font that's just really, really bold. It's uh, got a nice, like on the on the K, it's got a nice curve to that bottom arm of the K. And it just looks very 70s and very pleasing. The C is just delightfully almost a Pac-Man. The, the E, the, the middle bar of the E is curved. Um, there's just little surprises, little surprising details here. But overall, just a big, bold font with a big, extruded, solid black 3D shadow. Love it. Um, so in 1977, Milton Glaser was involved in the design of the Big Kitchen in the World Trade Center's concourse in New York City. Never forget. Collaborating with architect James Lamantia, restaurateur Joseph Baum, and interior designers Harper and George, uh, quote, Glaser introduced large-scale freestanding seven-and-a-half-foot high sculptural sans-serif letter forms uh, that announced the Big Kitchen as well as functioned as seating, counter space, and privacy hedges. 
Oh, and I'm going to, if that sounds confusing, it is until you see the photo because then you're like, whoa, okay. It's so 70s. It's so cool. Everything is just covered. It's like an entire food court just wrapped in the van's slip-on shoes, checkerboard skin, everything. It's just so cool. I want to recreate this somehow in some format. So he created these huge um, extruded 3D letter forms and uh, they were kind of like blo- like between the table part of the food court and the where you order your food. Um, so you could walk up to the uh, the back of the letters and part of the letters, the bottom half of the letters were extruded more than the top part. So it created a counter where you could set your food down. Um, and then you could also sit on them or whatever. Um, each monumental letter form based on a custom typeface, also designed by Glazer, was covered in a checkerboard motif as a graphic reference to old-fashioned dining establishments. This comprehensive sign program also included signs, menus, promotional and advertising materials, logo types, and the commissioning of art for interior spaces. Um, and that's a quote by Richard Poulin in Graphic Design and Architecture, a 20th Century History. It is just so cool looking um, that he created this really neat space and he sort of takes you into his paintings with, uh, you know, working with architects in this way, which I really love. Uh, P22 released an official digital version named P22 Glazer Kitchen. Cool. It was completed by James uh, Greischaber and comes with 3D styles. It can be layered for chromatic effect. Thank you very much, James. Of course, we also have the stencil font, which is everywhere. It's very utilitarian, very versatile, um, and it comes in different weights, and it's been kind of updated and kind of cleaned up, especially the lighter weight has been cleaned up. Um, I used I thought that that one was the same as the Einstein font, but it's not. There are two different fonts, and Einstein is really cool. It's the one where the middle bars on the uppercase letters are tilted. Also, there's the craziest one called Film Sense, which makes no sense as far as like, what is a designer going to do? It's too complicated. It's so funny to me, Um, but it's so cute. It's very rounded, very 70s, lots of stripes. Uh, There's a solid, a stripe, and a white, Um, and you could fill in color anywhere and any. It's too many choices. I I just get overwhelmed when I see something like this. Like, how am I going (laughs) to... You know, it can only be on a solid background and then it, it's limited. You know, the more complicated a, a typeface or a font, it's it's limited. Um, so it's designed at Pushpin Studios in 1967. And it says, um, gives credit to both Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast um, and produced and sold by photo lettering in two styles. Um, there's a simpler version. And... The first version was uh, used in 1969 for the Alphabet Yearbook. Uh, let's see. S- and this one is, like, controversial because there's... Uh, Seymour Quas claims that it was his design. It was his design from the book, the Pushpin Graphic from 2004. But Milton Glaser also claims it. So to to avoid the, the discrepancy, um, usually they're just both credited. So a little drama there with Film Sense. But uh, you'll see it's used for um, these John Creasy novels. And it became sort of his brand where he used, he applied it with all these different colors. And it's very memorable looking. There's a way people have overlapped the letters. It looks really cool because the O is very, it's a perfect circle and with a huge counter. So you could either fill that up with color or have something showing through. Just fun to look through these. I want to say thank you to Fonts in Use. Um, If you haven't heard the show, I love Fonts in Use. I use it all the time um, just to see uh, if you click on a designer's name, you can see all the fonts they've created. Also, you can click on a foundry. You can click on, the, of course, the typeface and see all the ways it's been used, um, or a lot of them anyway. And it's just really fascinating. And also... Uh, how it's been paired with other typefaces, and you can get ideas on how to pair them. Give it a thought. So, you know, that is my take on on Milton Glaser, and 
Another way that I, I show tribute is just posting all my favorite images. Um, so people ask, how do you do a podcast about a visual subject? And that's just how. I mean, it's it's half Instagram ha or, or website, and then the other half is here. So thank you for everything. You've contributed to our world, Milton Glaser. I can't imagine a world without it, without the influence, not only through paintings and artwork, but also amazing graphic design. Thank you for listening, everybody. Check out Milton Glaser's albums. Look at all the resources I posted and have fun and take care of yourself. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.